I don't mean to say, and no one can say to you, that there are no dangers. Of course there are risks if we are not vigilant. But we do not have to be hysterical. We can be vigilant, we can be Americans. We can stand up and hold up our heads and say, America is the greatest force that God has ever allowed to exist on his footstool. As such, it is up to us to lead this world to a peaceful new world order. It is a big idea. A new world order. A new world order. A new world order. Global policemen for the new world order. For the Bush administration in search of a new world order, it, it would all herald a new order. Merge our nation with communism in a one world tyranny. The plans to alter the United States and comfortably merge our nation with the Soviets in a one world tyranny ought to be obvious to all. Was es uns gelang, dem deutschen Volk eine neue Idee zu geben? What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, the idea, the idea. Was es uns gelang, dem deutschen Volk eine neue Idee zu geben? Und dieses Volk in diese Idee zu einen, zu einen, zu einen und zu einer neuen Lebensform zu führen. Dies ist die größte Tat dieses Jahrhunderts für unser Volk. The question is, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? You refuse to answer that question, is that correct? I have told you that I will All right. offer my beliefs, my affiliations, and Excuse everything the else Excuse to the, the American man. public, and they will know where I stand, as they do from what I have written. Stand away from the stand. I have written stand. For, for Americanism for many years, and I shall... Stand away from the stand. Fight for the Bill of Rights, which I'll you are trying to destroy. Stand away from the stand. If the United Nations yields to the forces of aggression, no nation will be safe or secure. is Europe, you say. But let's see what can happen elsewhere in, say, the small town of Mawsonay, Wisconsin. Peaceful, isn't it? But the red truncheon falls and the chief of police is hustled off to jail. Next, public utilities are seized by fifth colonists. Watch carefully what happens to an editor who operates under a free press. He goes to jail, too, and his newspaper is confiscated. Exit freedom of thought. Yes, this is life under the Soviet form of government. The little town of Mawsonay made this experiment for 24 hours, a public service to all America. It can't happen here? Well, this is what it looks like, if it should. The Mount Carmel property was established as a religious retreat by its founders in 1935. Followers came to be known as Branch Davidians. In 60 years, there had been only one incident in an otherwise unblemished record of the Branch Davidians' peaceful existence with their neighbors. One wife. Have you I've committed? I've always had... Have I committed adultery? Would you fix that have, you, have you committed adultery? <laughs> no, I don't commit adultery. You're telling me the truth? I'm telling you the truth. Have you beaten children? No, I do not beat children. I think the girl's name was Aisha. Yeah, but was her parents there? Her parents were there. Did you do it? No, I didn't do it. On page 48 of this book, written by our Vice President, he makes this statement. I'd like to read it to you word for word. 
Our challenge is to accelerate the needed change in thinking about our relationship to the environment in order to shift the pattern of our civilization to a new equilibrium. This change in thinking will also follow the pattern described in chaos theory with little change evident until a threshold is passed and then as key assumptions are modified, a flood of dramatic changes will occur all at once. If you understood what Al Gore just said, he said there's a threshold coming and once the threshold is crossed, a flood of dramatic changes in our civilization will occur all at once. He makes the same point again on page 355. I'd like to read that uh, quote as well from page 355 of his book entitled The Earth in the Balance. And indeed, the model of change we use in designing and implementing our strategy should be based on the assumption that there is a threshold we must cross and, not, and that not very much change will be apparent and obvious until we reach that threshold. But when it is finally reached, the changes will be sudden and dramatic. So here we have Al Gore saying some dramatic event is going to occur and once that, that event occurs, a flood of dramatic changes will occur in our civilization. This dramatic change in our civilization is called the New World Order. The loss you feel must not paralyze your own lives. Instead, you must try to pay tribute to your loved ones by continuing to do all the things they left undone, thus ensuring they did not die in vain. They did not die in vain. They did not die in vain. These poor boys will shed bare innocent blood in a war that this country is provoking. Hey, get a load of that. Asiatic people all want the peaceful establishment of native regimes without the interference of United States troops. Communists don't want war. War would be world suicide. Only communist countries can guarantee you peace. To a peaceful and secure existence. And I assure you, we can do it. Now, if we first take a look at the strength of America, you and I know that it's the most productive nation on earth, that we are richer by any standard of comparison than is any other nation in the world. We know that we have great military strength, economic, intellectual, This total strength of America is one of those things we call, and the world calls, unbelievable. For those who do not believe and know this, there are concentration camps. I told you several years ago about Dr. Waymar Pabst who filed a lawsuit against President Gerald Ford, 1976 I believe it was, existence of a concentration camp program within the United States of America. Now I'll let that settle in a little bit. We're talking about a concentration camp program for American citizens. Dr. Papps discovered that it, what it really meant was anybody who opposed government policy, I got a place for you in a prison camp. Two, let me read just a little bit of this suit here to familiarize yourself. And I'm reading directly from a copy of the actual complaint that was filed. 
plaintiff is the people of the United States of America, ex rel William R. Papps versus Gerald R. Ford, President, Donald Rumsfeld, Secretary of the Defense, and others, too numerous to mention. For the, of all persons similarly situated within the United States, This is a proceeding for declaratory judgment to the plaintiff's rights of permanent injunction restraining the defendants from committing acts complained of herein. Defendants are officials of the U.S. government, are being sued in their official capacities and as individuals. Plaintiff alleges that there exists in Livonia, Michigan, within the free and sovereign territory of the United States, an obscure military operation called the 300th Military Police Prisoner of War Command. Members of this command are located throughout the United States. Further, plaintiff alleges that among the purposes of this operation are the detention, incommunicado and otherwise, holding points for citizens of the United States for shipment elsewhere to undetermined fates. Said prisoners are classified as, quote, inventory. You thought you were a citizen. <laughs> they think you're inventory. Further, plaintiff alleges that there exists a Department of Defense, Department of Army computer program, or a program to which defendants have access for the arrest and or control of an indeterminate number of United States citizens due to their previous outspoken nonviolent political conduct. Our foreign policy is the United States of America. Now as I mention this, this young lady here should be aware of the fact that your conduct is considered outspoken nonviolent political conduct against the internal affairs of the U.S. government, you see. Anybody who speaks out against government policy, you're noted, okay? Further plaintiff alleges that the geographical areas or centers to be used include, but are not limited to, Allenwood, Pennsylvania, Mill Point, West Virginia, Greenville, South Carolina, Montgomery, Alabama, and the rest of them are listed. They would be operated under the auspices of the Public Health Service of the United States. Say, so how does he know all this? Because they obtain documentation, Im information through the Freedom of Information Act. Where say, can stuff like this happen? Don't be stupid. What about the, the Iranian uh, connection, the arms sale? Does your government pull off shenanigans and then try to cover up and say it doesn't exist and it doesn't happen? Is it high time to recognize that, hey, wake up, friends. We're not going to live forever and ever and ever here in Never Never Land. The Bible is true. Every prophecy in it is being focused in in this hour. This is the high time that I'm talking about. Plaintiff and the class he represents are now suffering and will continue to suffer irreparable injury from defendant's policies as set forth herein because the active planning and preparation of unconstitutional activities that can only occur during a period in which the Constitution is suspended is repugnant to the Constitution, anti-constitutional act depriving plaintiffs of having exercised the right to free speech by placing them in fear of reprisals for the exercise thereof by means calculated to, pri to deprive them of life, liberty, and property without due process of law. In other words, because of the existence of this camp program, which has never been shut down, it's still ongoing, the computers are still filing information. Every time you speak out, every time you write a letter to the editor, every time you call your congressman, every time you do something like that, you're further in jeopardy because this exists. Why do they want to build all these prisons? Why are they wanting to build all these prisons, friends? Why is this present world going to war against, quote, the religious right? Why are they making big news about the fact that there are preachers who have contact with millions of people and take in millions of dollars? Why are they such a threat? Do you men have a conscience? Do you men realize what you're doing under God, under heaven? You're writing him up as if he were a criminal. A judge was sen sentencing him to jail as though he were a rapist or a murderer. When I found out that the pastor had gone to jail, I felt kind of angry because he was trying to teach us how to do right, and he went to jail for that. The lawbreaker. Yes, That's right. He has trampled yes, upon the Constitution of the United right. States right. and upon the Constitution right. of this state of Nebraska. That's right. The word of God. One month after jailing the pastor, Sheriff Tetch returned to empty and padlock the church by force because members refused to compromise their religious and constitutional rights.
This order directs me to secure this building with locks so as to prevent holding school in the building without following the state law requiring a certified teacher. But at this time, I and members of the Nebraska State Patrol will escort you from this building so we can comply with this order signed by the judge. Do you men realize what you're doing under God, under heaven? We must learn to live in a world where we have the hydrogen bomb and the enemy of freedom has the hydrogen bomb. We wish you it means success in that uh, that you show the actual possibilities of America, and we will be able to say, here are the possibilities of America. How long does it exist? How many years? 300? 300? 150 years of independence? Then we will say that America exists 150 years. Here is its level. We are 42 years, not quite. Another seven years, and we will be on the same level as America. Then in the future, we will go ahead, and we might overtake you at the cross. The back of the dollar bill has something very unique, and I think most of you uh, patriots have probably been told this so many times, uh, you probably don't want to hear it anymore. Uh, does, it, does anyone not understand what the symbol on the back of the dollar bill means? If you just put up your hand, okay, and everyone else does, right? Okay, essentially it's a satanic symbol that goes back to 1776, and uh, the, the guy who really designed this was uh, Adam Weishaupt, May 1 of 1776. He designed it to announce something, and then it was brought over to America from Europe, and it was placed on the back of the seal of the United States, but it wasn't brought publicly off that occultic seal until 1935 by the Roosevelt administration. And Roosevelt and his vice president, Henry Wallace, both 32nd degree Masons and heavily into the occult and basically socialist, or nice word for communist, uh, they put the seal on the back of the dollar bill to announce what would be coming 60 years later. So in 1935, this was approved, it was placed on the back of the dollar bill, and in Latin it says, Anuit coeptus novus ordo seclorum, mean announcing the birth of the new world order. Announcing the birth of the new world order. And they knew it wouldn't come to fruition for 60 more years. And if you take 1935 and add 60 to it, you get about 1995. And that's why George Bush in 1990 announced the satanic communist new world order. Now, if you haven't, how many of you heard George Bush use that term, new world order? Good. Yeah, did you know that George Bush's dad helped finance Adolf Hitler through Brown Brothers Harriman Bank in the 30s? Yeah, okay. Do you know George Bush was, belongs to a secret occultic organization, the Skull and Bones Brotherhood of Death Society? Yeah, most of you are pretty educated, okay? But there are a few people in here that already mentioned they were shocked to hear that. So, uh, you know, he had to lie down naked in a coffin and, and uh, be carried around by his 14 other witchcraft brothers and get renamed as Poppy in the tomb building in New Haven, Connecticut in 1948. George is not a nice guy, but he claims he's a Christian, he claims he's a patriot, he claims he's a war hero, and he said, read my hips, no new taxes, and we got them anyway, right? Okay, and he said, uh, the new world order does not mean we'll lose our sovereignty, and that was another lie, and it's just lie, 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 and of course, Clinton's no better, he's even worse. But we're going to play just a few of those speeches so that everybody will have an opportunity to hear what Georgie said during 1990 about his new world order. And by the way, did you know that Hitler's second book after Mein Kampf was called My New World Order? It's almost extinct. You can hardly find it. A friend of mine found it in Australia in a used bookstore where it was published. And I actually have a, a, a photocopy of Hitler's book. I borrowed it from my friend and I uh, photographed it, took it to a uh, professional photographer, photographed it, spent a couple hundred dollars on that, and I put it in the back of my book so you can actually see Adolf Hitler's book, My New World Order. Now, so let's listen to a couple of speeches from Georgie Bush. And uh, by the way, you know, he, he's supposed to be out of power. How come he just met with Gorby? 
his other communist friend, uh, uh, just the uh, end of last year, and, he, and another communist, Margaret Thatcher, they're all sitting there with all those Buddhists, weirdos, New Agers, and uh, occultists, and communists, and socialists, and Ted Turner, and uh, Hanoi Jane, and uh, all, those, all those fruitcakes in the world were at the Masonic Temple on Knob Hill. I mean, just an appropriate place, you know, a temple where they worship Lucifer. You know, the Masonic Temple planning the New World Order under the Antichrist. Wow. Here we go. The President George Bush has talked time and time again about the New World Order. And this is the best chance to begin to establish the New World Order. A New World Order. New World Order. To fulfill the long-held promise of a New World Order. A New World Order. A new world order. We have a real chance at this new world order. And it has to do with a new world order. That is the only way the new world order will be enhanced. And why the world has turned so much toward a new world order and a new kind of civilization. Mikhail Gorbachev's interpreter. In, okay, how did he define the new world order? A new kind of global civilization. Global communism. That's what the new world order is. And Hitler called uh, Nazism National Socialism, and the communists called their form of Nazism or communism socialism. And the New World Order is basically a combination of fascism and communism in its final form, repackaged so that we can all swallow it. Called they call it global democracy now. Yeah. Mm hmm. Hmm. In the last days, they shall believe the lie. Right. Listen to a few more. Now they dreamed of a new age. Another satanic term, new age, thousand points of light, new world order, okay, peace and safety, all satanic terms from occultic sources. In these dramatic moves toward a new world of peace and security. And God bless the United States of America. Right. But he does have a God, doesn't he? The God of the skull and bones. The God is Lucifer. The God of Freemasonry is Lucifer, you see? So he's asking his God, not our God. And that's what deceives people. And Bill Clinton prays too, doesn't he? He cries and he says he's a Baptist and uh, cites scripture incorrectly out of context, right? I, I, but, but Hillary and Billary are just, you know, they're really religious, aren't they? You know? And they got lots of dead bodies floating around and uh, uh, lots of water under the water gate. I mean, they're uh, <laughs> white water. And yet uh, the polls say they're going to be reelected. I mean, that's how bad America is that, that's what kind of shape we are in right now bad shape in the persian gulf and in this new world order that we seek to create over and over again george bush says we seek to create now who's we 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 if you say i it's one person can you have a conspiracy with me myself and i no uh by definition in laws in the black's law dictionary a, a conspiracy is defined as two or more people who get together to plan something that's illegal. Is the New World Order illegal? Yes, it, it does away with the Constitution of the United States, brings us under the United Nation of Global Communism. So it's illegal, constitutionally speaking. And were two or more people involved, you can have a trillion. There are only six billion people on the planet, but you can have a trillion, right? According to the law, you have to have two or more. George Bush says, we want a New World Order, so you got two or more. And when Gorby said, yes, George Bush and I will build a new world together on the front page of Time magazine in 1989, he confirmed that he was at least one other conspirator for a communist new world order. Okay, listen to a couple more. President Bush has spoken about the possibility of a new world order. The new world order does not mean surrendering our national sovereignty. Read my lips. It does not mean surrendering our national sovereignty. Okay, now, when Georgie e. Bush uh, announced the new world order of global communism under the Antichrist, and that's who will eventually lead it, the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that the world will be divided into ten kingdoms, and it's interesting that under the Treaty of Rome, it's already been divided into ten regions. So it's not being called ten kingdoms, like the Bible says, it's being called ten regions. The United States and Canada are region one of the new world order. Uh, but when George Bush announced this new world order, and he had to, uh, okay, because the, the Lord's over him, and the chief one being Lucifer, but the Lord's over him and the Illuminati made him do it. And he didn't come up with those speeches. He read those speeches off of teleprompters. They were prepared for him, see? So his script was already read 
uh, uh, it was already prepared long before he made the speeches. Uh, but one of the major books that came out uh, talking about the New World Order right after George announced it was this one here that I'm showing you a, a blown up cover of. It's called The Keys of This Blood, and there's a picture of the Pope right on the front here. Uh, it was written by a, an ex-insider, a very high-level ex-insider, Mr. Malachi Martin, uh, who's essentially writing for the Pope here. Okay, now this book is, uh, is an absolute mind-blower, and I'm going to read you three paragraphs from the very first page, so you'll see what I mean. The subtitle says, Pope John Paul II versus Russia and the West for control of the New World Order. So right on the front cover of this very voluminous $15 book, it says that there are three major contenders who want to control the New World Order, right? The Pope, or Catholicism, uh, the West, you know, meaning the, the free countries, mainly us, and of course, Communist Russia. Okay, now, the bottom line is simply this. The Bible tells us that there'll be a false religion in the last days and that the Antichrist will actually have a religious leader who will side with him called the false prophet. Many evangelicals who are fundamentalist Christians like me have believed for years that this false religious system might turn out to be the Catholic system and it's looking more like that every day. Now I'm not saying if you're Catholic that you're a part of that because uh, there are many fine Christians in the Catholic system but I am saying the system itself looks Antichrist in nature and uh, it looks as though it's going to fulfill prophecy. Now let's uh, share just three paragraphs of this very occultic book here that essentially uh, tells us what's going to happen here in the next three and a half years. Uh, the very first paragraph boggles the mind. The very first page will absolutely blow you away. But let me just share a few of those things. Willing or not, ready or not, we are all involved in an all-out, no-holds-barred, three-way global competition. Most of us are not the competitors in this competition, however. We are the prize. See? Willing or not, ready or not, somebody's going to win us in this competition. Okay? Now, it continues here. Most of us are not the competitors. We are the prize. For the competition is about who will establish the first one world system of government that has ever existed in the society of nations. It is about who will hold and wield the dual power of authority and control over each of us as individuals and over all of us together collectively as a global community. In fact, over the entire six billion people who are expected to inhabit Earth by what year? The year 2000. Okay, and then it says the competition is all out because now that it has started, and that's what George Bush announced, the New World Order, the New World Order. See, that's when it started. That's when this book came out. The copyright is 1990. The competition is all out, it says, because now that it has started, there is no way it can be reversed or called off. That's a pretty profound statement, isn't it? There is no way. It can be stopped. Now, there's only one way something can't be stopped, and that's if it's ordained by God and it's a fulfillment of prophecy. Maybe that's what's happening, right? In fact, I'm pretty convinced. So then it goes on to say, no holds are barred in this competition because once the competition has been decided, the world and all that's in the world, our way of life as individuals and citizens of sovereign nations, our families, our jobs, our trade, our commerce, our money, our educational systems, and our religions. Oh, our religions are going to change. Uh, and our cultures, our national identity, all of these things and more will have been powerfully and radically altered forever. No one can be exempted from its effects and no sector of our lives will remain untouched. That's just three paragraphs. Do I, say, do I need to say more? Everything's going to change by what year? the year 2000. And they say over and over again here, 2000, 2000, the year 2000, the year 2000, the year 2000, the year 2000, over and over. Now, the same year, another publication came out from a United Nations think tank called the World Federalist Association. I actually have this book from them, uh, the title of which is indicated here on the front cover. It's called A New World Order. Can it bring security to the people, to the world's people? 
And then it says essays on restructuring the United Nations. The World Federalist Association, Washington, D.C. has a, a new preamble to the Constitution for the F Federation of Earth on the back of it. It's absolutely occultic and insane. But on page 102, I focused on what my mission is, and that's to educate you on how we're going to be controlled and surveilled, and uh, basically electronically surveilled and uh, enslaved in the New World Order. So on page 102 of this book, by the World Federalist Association, it says exactly the truth here. And I'm amazed I, I had to read through this 150-page book to get one statement that says the truth. Part 4, Alternative Paths to a New World Order, says this by Mr. Richard Falk. He says, it is evident that the New World Order, as conceived in Washington, is about control and surveillance. Now, hold on to those two wor words, because that's all we're going to talk about the rest of the night. How we're going to be controlled and surveilled. Now, remember, I just read Malachi Martin's book, where he said, the authority and control over each of us. See, over and over again, I see these key words being used over and over again to describe how we're all going to have our lives changed by the year 2000. We're going to be controlled and surveillance, and there's going to be some authority over us. And everyone will be affected, and no one will be exempted. You see? So he says here, it is evident that the New World Order, as conceived in Washington, is about control and surveillance, and not about better vi values or a better life for the peoples of the world. Now, this guy at least was intellectually honest enough to tell us the truth, wasn't he? And he's one of them. He's a New World Order boy. Now, remember I told you that Gorby and Bush and Thatcher, all those socialists and, and uh, communists and uh, New Agers and Buddhists and uh, you name it, uh, every uh, mole from the hole in the planet, on the planet, met over there to plan the New World Order. But the San Francisco Chronicle newspaper announced it a few months before it happened. So this is an article from the San Francisco Chronicle dated Friday, February 3, 1995, a few months before that meeting occurred. And it says here, Gorbachev to convene meeting in San Francisco in fall of 95. And it says here, the Gorbachev Foundation, by the way, did you know that the Gorbachev Foundation is a tax-free corporation using your, your funds? And did you know George Bush, under executive decree, gave the Presidio military base to Gorby so he could run uh, the communist foundation called the Gorby Peace Foundation and plan to take over the United States tax-free on a US military base former US military base okay uh, and I, I'm amazed I, I go into churches and, and people are so deceived uh, because they're not patriots and they don't study like we do and they're so deceived and they actually think George Bush is a fine man I have uh, Rush Limbaugh says if George Bush were back in power everything would be fine <laughs> yeah Rush is, uh, is out of touch and he ain't right and, and he thinks we're kooks for believing in a new world order, but I'd rather believe Rockefeller, and I got Rockefeller on tape right now. We're going to play that, okay? But it says here, uh, Gorbachev to convene meeting in San Francisco in fall, and George Bush and Margaret Thatcher will be there, and they're going to discuss here in the last paragraph in the left column, a new world order. So, you know, Rush Limbaugh says anybody who believes a, a new world order is coming is a kook. Well, I don't hear him calling Henry Kissinger that. And Henry says it every day. I don't hear him call uh, Bill Clinton that, and, and you know that Bill Clinton said it in Latin on the front page of the LA Times the day he came to power? He was inaugurated, it said, Novus Ordo Seclorum, a new age now begins under me. Okay, now Gorby's uh, communist book uh, that our Wall Street bankers financed and published in 1987, two years before the wall came down in Berlin, right? He announced to us what he was gonna do, okay, so Gorby tells us here in no uncertain terms what's going on in his own 87 book. Now the book is out of print now and it's hard to locate, but you can still find them. Uh, get a copy of it, it'll blow your mind. Uh, Perestroika is the Russian word that means restructure. Well, they're gonna restructure the whole world into global communism, right? So it says, a new thinking. This is the blown up cover of his book, okay? New thinking for our country and what? The whole world. Yeah, the new thinking is, please accept communism now that we have you brainwashed. That's what it means. Now, listen to just a couple of statements here, and then we're going to listen to uh, a book by a former comrade of his. He's now a U.S. citizen, but he used to be a KGB agent working under Gorby. He's going to tell us what Gorby really says. But Gorby says it himself, and that's what's so foolish of we Americans. You know, he says it himself right here. Listen. On page 22 of Perestroika, Gorbachev said, 
we are conducting all of our reforms in accordance with the socialist choice. Now, the word socialist is just a nice swallowable term for what? Communist. So it says here, we are conducting all of our reforms in accordance with the socialist choice. We are looking within socialism rather than outside it for the answers to all the questions that arise. Those who hope that we will move away from the socialist path will be greatly disappointed. Every part of our program of perestroika, and the program as a whole for that matter, is fully based on the principle of more socialism. We will proceed toward better socialism than away from it. Now listen to this. We are saying this honestly without even trying to fool our own people or the people of the world. You see, he says this in his book. He says, we want more communism. We're not even going to try to fool you idiots anymore. You know, you're so stupid. And he actually says that somewhere else. Stupid and decadent. They actually, uh, communists think we're stupid and decadent and ready to be enslaved and, and killed. Okay? And so it says here that any hopes that we will begin to build a different non-socialist society and go over to the other capitalist camp are unrealistic and futile. Those in the West who expect us to give up socialism will be greatly disappointed. It is high time they understood this. We, the Soviet people, are for more socialism. We want more socialism, page 28. We want to strengthen socialism, page 37. Perestroika is a revolutionary process for it is a jump forward in the development of global socialism. Do I need to read any more? Sickening, isn't it? Aren't we stupid in America? Yes. La, 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 la. Listen to what my mom said about how bad things are back home. And everybody's hoarding. Profiteers are getting fat contracts. Neighbors say politicians are using the war to their own advantage. And all our chief atomic scientists are spies. Not a lot more. Now, just take it with a grain of salt. Uh, let me tell you how the commies plant propaganda back home. Some time ago, Mac, Johnny, and I managed to get our last leave together in a big city. These poor boys will shed their innocent blood in a war that this country is provoking. Hey, get a load of that. Asiatic people all want the peaceful establishment of native regimes without the interference of United States troops. Communists don't want war. War would be world suicide. Only communist countries can guarantee you peace. It claims to be the resu result of a commission that was reportedly authorized in August of 1963 by the John Kennedy administration. People like Robert McNamara and Dean Rusk and others decided there was a need to study a, uh, the, the movement towards a condition of universal peace. So this commission was studied, was created, and three years later, approximately two and a half years later, in uh, I believe it was uh, August of uh, June of 1967, maybe a few months later, September of 1967, this book was published called Report from Iron Mountain. This book is the next step in understanding why possibly the, we're starting to get an influx of new material on the, uh, uh, the aliens and whether or not they're real. I'd like to start with the premise that this book was asked to study, with this commission was asked to study, and that is we, they have been using war as a means of controlling our society for very benevolent and beneficial motives. And those are all spelled out in this book entitled Report from Iron Mountain. This commission went on to say, if we have a condition of universal peace, how are we going to control society, individuals, and movements? So the question was, what do we do if we do have a, a situation where war is finally eliminated and we disarm the population? On page eight of this booklet, 
entitled Report from Iron Mountain. We find this as their challenge, and this is their uh, command. Two broad questions were surfaced, and they are as follows. What can be expected if peace comes? What should we be, what should we be prepared to do about peace, a condition of universal peace? So that is the question they were going to examine since war had been used for some 200 years, if not longer, to control societies. What are we going to do later about how are we going to control people if war if, is abolished and we end up with the ultimate situation of universal peace after we've all disarmed? This is a continuation of the thought on page 29. The fact that a society is organized for any degree of readiness for war su supersedes its political and economic structure. War itself is the basic social system within which other secondary modes of social organization conflict and or conspire. It is the system which has governed most human societies of record as it is today. So here we have the admission that war has been used by governments to control societies. It's got nothing to do with conflicts between one society and another. It's got something to do with control. So now the question is, what do we do if we eliminate war and end up with a condition of universal peace. As we're continuing our study of this, this book goes on to point out, the report from Iron Mountain, published in 1967, that there are invisible or implied functions of war, beyond the dramatic ones of fighting back an, an, an enemy or destroying the enemy. There are other reasons for war, and we've got to understand those to understand possibly why the alien abduction stories that are surfacing and now this autopsy are surfacing, there might be a reason for it. So the, one of the invisible or implied functions of war is to control societies. We can now go to page 38 in our study and read this. Although we do not imply that a substitute for war in the economy can be, cannot be devised, no combination of techniques for controlling employment, production, and consumption has yet been tested that can remotely compare to it in effectiveness. It is and has been the essential economic stabilizer, stabilizer of modern societies. So war, and now ultimately the possibility of war has been used against us. What are we going to do if suddenly we have a peace, universal peace, come upon the earth? The report continues on page 39. The possibility of war provides the sense of external necessity without which no government can long remain in power. The historical record reveals one instance after another where the failure of a regime to maintain the credibility of a war threat led to its dissolution. The organization of a society for the possibility of war, of war is its principal political stabilizer. So not only the th war, but the threat of war has been used against us to control our society. Page 47 continues. A viable substitute for war as a social system cannot be a mere symbolic charade. It must involve real risk of real personal destruction and on a scale consistent with the size and complexity of modern social systems. Whether the substitute is, ri is ritual in nature or functionally substantive, unless it provides a believable life and death threat, it will not serve the socially organizing functions of war. The existence of an external, of an accepted external menace, then, is essential to social cohesiveness as well as to the acceptance of political authority. The menace must be believable. It must be of a magnitude consistent with the complexity of the society threatened, and it must appear at least to affect the entire society. So we're looking for something that will be, that will give these controllers the, the implied threat that they can use to control societies. It must affect all of us equally. It must appear to be completely destructive if it does su succeed. And then we will unite behind that implied threat against it in a one world new, new civilization, one world order, new world order, one world government. In fact, they specifically mentioned in 1967 that the UFO alien threat could be used exactly for that purpose. And I want to conclude with this last quote. On, from page 66, because this might be the reason suddenly we're going to start getting more and more evidence that this UFO threat is real. Page 66, the most ambitious and unrealistic space project cannot of itself generate a believable external menace. It has been hotly argued 
that such a menace would offer the last best hope of peace by uniting mankind against the danger of destruction by creatures from other planets or from outer space. Experiments have been proposed to test the credibility of an out-and-out -out world invasion threat. It is possible that a few of the more difficult to explain flying saucer incidents of recent years were in fact early experiments of this kind. Nevertheless, an effective political substitute for war would require alternate enemies, some of which might seem equally far-fetched in the context of the current war system. So is it possible that the autopsy report is going to be used as the first of a means of, whether it's real or not, of uniting, the, of giving us an external threat so huge, so frightening, so destructive, that all of the world will unite to combat it. And then they can use that threat, which is probably th of their own making. And I believe my feeling is that the autopsy is not legitimate. We're going to probably find that it is a, a fraud. But is that possible that that is what it was created for, to give us a threat of an implied invasion or a current invasion from aliens that we must unite behind uh, uh, universally. The uh, book ends on page 67, at least the last quote I want to read, is it constitutes a threat that can be dealt with only through social organization and political power. So the question I'm asking and wish to ask is, is it possible that the alien invasion is a fraud that we're going to be con convinced is real and that's why this invasion, this autopsy was released, that we will start the process of convincing us that we need to combat against it universally because it is totally destructive. Is this the, the threshold that Al Gore talked about that's going to lead to the dramatic changes, a flood of which will convince us to eliminate or completely alter our existing society and give us this thing called the New World Order? It bears watching, and I think that's what this is all about. The invasion of the aliens will be something that they can use as a means of changing our society into the new world order. <laughs> By the way, I have an Orange County registered document in the back of my book that says the Pentagon is planning to have Armageddon in the year 2000. Did you guys know that the Pentagon has actually set a date for Armageddon? No, I, you know, I mean, it sounds like a joke, but I'm serious. Uh, it's right in my book, and uh, it's on page 709 for those of you who have already picked up a copy of my book. And for the young lady who is here from the Orange County Register, it was published in the February 17, 1992, Monday edition of the Orange County Register, which was reprinted from the New York Times on that date. And the New York Times article was prepared by Patrick Tyler, and it talks about the Pentagon envisioning seven conflict scenarios to end the decade, and they lay out here seven conflict scenarios that they're strategically and monetarily planning for. It's interesting uh, that they say there'll be another Iraqi war. Well, there will be, according to them. And then they say that there'll be a Korean war. Well, that's why we're seeing one million troops on the uh, Korean border right now. The, but what's interesting is item seven here, the final scenario says, Russia will cause the problem calling for a total mobilization for global war in the year 2001 a total mobilization for global war in the year 2001. Now, did they use the word Armageddon, which comes from two Hebrew words, meaning it's going to be fought in Israel, okay? But no, they didn't use the word Armageddon, but what do you, tell, what do you call a total mobilization for global war if it ain't Armageddon? This whole UFO thing, the first thing you want to think about is divine decree. Uh, the idea that, that God uh, is going to gather everything together in an open display in the apocalyptic process, but the apocalypse, the day of the apocalypse hasn't come yet. So because it hasn't come yet, we may be getting some pre-apocalyptic suggestions, but we're not getting an open display. And that's the classic reason why the UFOs don't just land. Because that's what they do in the day the Earth stood still. You get a UFO that lands in a baseball field. And that in itself just reeks of apocalypse. Because uh, almost by definition, apocalypse means the uncovering of that which is hidden up to now. And it means that things that have been around the periphery of our public consciousness suddenly come crowding in and land and interact and speak and all the rest of it. So it's the very essence of the very idea of apocalypse. I make no bones about it. I learned how to think apocalyptically before becoming a fundamentalist Christian. I became a fundamentalist Christian in 1962, but it was 1951, 52, 56 that the science fiction films, that's culture, that's literature, that's drama, and boy, I'm telling you, I owe a debt to that. I've learned a lot from films, and it's not just intellectual, it's emotional. And it's a, an emotional predisposition 
to uh, entertain the I thought that there's going to come a day when the earth will stand still, so to speak. Another thing I like in the War of the Worlds, there she is, Anne Robinson, Jean Barry. <laughs> uh, one thing I like is that in that film, one of the great scenes in that film, is that when the UFOs are starting to land and crash land is what they do, and they're out in the desert, you have a clergyman conducting a dance and just carrying on the work of the present age just uh, routinely. And one thing that happens is, because of an electromagnetic storm or something set off by the UFOs, everybody's watch stops. And that's like stopping time, and that kind of stopping time is what you're looking at when you look at the apocalyptic process. In other words, eternity is invading time. And the result is things that have been mysterious up to now become plain. Uh, that's one thing that apocalypse means. It means simplification. Things that are mysterious or complicated or seem ambiguous or whatever all of a sudden have an unambiguous meaning. And that clearly is the case with the Antichrist. That's clearly the case, I think, with the resurrection of the Christian dead. Okay, now let's read something else. The Perestroika Deception. Excellent book. If you want to get a copy of this, it's hard to find. I'll just give you the phone number for the publisher in New York. Uh, the publisher in New York is 212-697-7212. That's 212-697-7212. Anatola Golitsyn is the author, G-O-L-I-T-S-Y-N, and the title of the book is The Perestroika Deception. Okay, an incredible book. Now, he says that when we get taken over in America, it's going to be the second October Revolution. You see, the first October Revolution was the Bolshevik Revolution in which month of 1917? October. Why? It's a satanic holiday, Halloween, the most evil of all satanic holidays. And Satan, through Karl Marx, who was a Satanist, in, allegedly, he didn't really invent it, but he was given credit for having invented communism. He was a Satanist. So where did communism really came, come from originally? From Satan, the devil. Because the devil comes to rob, kill, steal, and destroy. And communism does that. You see, so the world order that's coming will be global communism under the devil himself, the Antichrist, the devil in a man's body, just as Jesus was God in a man's body. The Antichrist, the devil himself, is going to come and lead his invention, global communism. And if you find, uh, if, uh, with a, just a little bit of study, you'll find at the core of all of this political stuff is satanic cults, skull and bones, brotherhood of death and on and on. The Majestic Twelve, the Bohemian Owl Worshipping Society that George Bush belongs to in San Francisco. Okay, uh, yeah, the P2 cult that's affiliated with the Catholicism in Europe. And he was a member of the, the Committee of 300. And on and on and on. And people are shocked to hear these things because you don't hear them in the media, do you? Now, Mr. Galitzin says on the back of his cover, uh, The Perestroika Deception, he says this pretty convincingly. He says, The Perestroika Deception book explains the devious secret intent behind the Leninist strategy which the so-called former communists are pursuing under cover of fake reform and fake progress toward democracy. The immediate, stra the immediate strategic objective is to converge America with communism on their terms, not ours. The ultimate objective is Lenin's replacement of the existing nation states with a new collective regional form of government as a building block to the new world social order, a world of communism. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Now, on page 158 of this book, he says what's about to happen. He says, be, and by the way, he says by the year 2000, that's their target date. He says behind the mask of diplomatic and political cooperation and partnership with the United States and Europe, the current Russian leaders are following the same old strategy of their predecessors and working towards a communist new world order. When the right moment comes, the mask of the deception will be dropped and the Russians, along with red Chinese help, will seek to impose their system on America on communist terms as the culmination of the second October Socialist Revolution for the world. Now, it's interesting if you study when the planned stock market crashes have occurred throughout history, what month do they usually occur in? October 29, October 87. Our fiscal year was set to begin October every year. Did you know that? By the Illuminati. Now, if you were a guessing man or woman, 
and you were to guess as to when the stock market might crash in the next three years, and it's planned to do so, what month would you approximate it would crash in? <laughs> December of this year. <laughs> it's a good Christmas present, right? Okay, now, if you were to speculate even further about a planned takeover of America, knowing that the Satanists and the Communists always kind of do it during their holiday of October, Halloween, uh, when would you suggest that perhaps America would be attacked? Maybe October. And he says that right on the front page of his book, The Second October Revolution. You see, and in the book, he says that they'll use an economic crash and a depression to create chaos so that Americans will be disoriented. And during that moment of disorientation, the Soviets will fly bombers over America after we've been disarmed. Now, the communists don't want to completely destroy us. They want to intimidate us into surrendering. And so uh, Galitzin says they'll probably uh, maybe use a small, limited nuclear bomb, bomb one area, frighten the living hell out of people, okay, and then send a bunch of Soviet bombers over America. And we have no strategic air command at all. Our missiles are all pointed out in the middle of the ocean, and our submarines and our ships have all been disarmed Okay, and, and if there are any left out there at sea, they're basically useless. Okay, and the rest of them have been cut up and sold for scrap metal. And so when this thing gets ready to go down, we'll, we'll simply have no alternative but to surrender to global communism. That's what's going to happen in the very near future. Okay. Now, uh, right after this meeting at the State of the World uh, Forum in San Francisco that I mentioned the end of last year, Gorby came out with his brand new book, okay, called the search for a new beginning, developing a new civilization of global communism. Of course, he doesn't say that. This is a very nicely packaged book, very pleasant deception, you see. And it says here on the cover, though, it says that this book offers uh, a thoughtful blueprint for the new world order. This is truly a search for a new beginning. So is it clear that the new world order in its final form is going to be global communism and spiritually, the Antichrist will lead that according to the book of Revelation. I hope that's clear. And he invented communism. Does that make sense now? Okay, now I'm going to read a couple other statements. Uh, you know, Gorby wrote that book, Perestroika, in 1987, right? While that book was in print, while it was going to the press and being printed, he made this statement to his comrades at the Politburo. In October of 1987, listen, see October? Okay, October of 1987, Gorby said this. In October 1917, we parted with the old world order, rejecting it once and for all. We are moving toward a new world order, comma, the world of communism. We shall never turn off that road. Now, that was October of 1987. Just a month later, he said to another group of commie comrades in the Politburo, you know, the Politburo is pretty high up there in the Communist Party, and they basically give the orders to everybody. He said this in uh, October, uh, I'm sorry, November of 1987. Gentlemen and comrades, do not be concerned about all you hear regarding my use of the terminology glasnost and perestroika or democracy in the coming years. These terms are being used primarily for outward consumption to deceive the West. There will be no significant internal change within the Soviet Union other than for deceptive outward cosmetic purposes. Our purpose is to first put the Americans to sleep and disarm them. And we want to accomplish this, this, and this, and this. And then he said, as soon as they are asleep, we will smash them. Now, another communist said before Gorbachev a few years earlier, he said it this way. He said, war to the hilt between communism and capitalism is inevitable. Today we are not quite strong enough, but soon we will be. To win, we shall need the element of surprise. So what does that tell you that's coming? A blitzkrieg. That's Hitler's use of the word blitzkrieg meant what? Surprise attack. One day everything will be fine, and the next day, bam! Okay? So that's what you can expect, and you need to get ready. And if people out there mock you for being a fool or for being an uh, uh, extremist, that's right, just call them comrade, Hillary, or Billary, or whatever. Walk away and get ready, because you know what's coming. Everyone else is deceived. That's why they think we're nuts, because they're all deceived. It's la-la land, it's everything's fine, and uh, let's go off into this new world order of socialism together, right? It's all about the change. So it says here, to win we shall need the element of surprise. The people will first have to be put to sleep. 
So we shall begin by launching the most spectacular peace movement ever recorded in history. Have they done that? Uh, there will be electrifying overtures and unheard of concessions by the communists. The capitalist countries having grown stupid and decadent from years of luxurious living will actually rejoice to cooperate with us in their own destruction. Are we doing that now? And we're smiling all the way to the bank, aren't we? Okay, they will leap at yet another chance to be friends with their communist partners. And as soon as their guard is down, we will smash them with our clenched fist. Uh, just take it with a grain of salt. Uh, let me tell you how the commies plant propaganda back home. Communists don't want war. War would be world suicide. Only communist countries can guarantee you peace. Only communist countries can guarantee you peace. see what's happening and that's why the Illuminati the world globalist leaders are now selling all of our grain to the communist nations they're not selling it to other capitalist nations I got Wall Street articles from the Wall Street Journal and everything else we are sell the commodity experts in Wall Street can't figure out who's giving the orders to sell all of our food so that we have a food shortage they said what's going on here there are gonna be food shortages here we're selling all of our grain to North Korea Communist Russia and our good friends in Red China that are operating all those slave labor camps and making your $10 tennis shoes, okay, we're selling all our food to them. Why? So there can be a shortage and America can be controlled by starving everyone into submission. Anyway, uh, I think we're living in some amazing <laughs> period of time. I mean, uh, so many things are happening uh, technologically, sociopolitic scenes are, are all everything is changing so fast and I think we are heading towards some kind of a paradigm shift or paradigm change in the next few years in other words the thinking of man is changing or rather some force is manipulating the belief systems of the public by a slow process, but a constant process of uh, uh, sensitization and uh, basically uh, brainwashing. And uh, I have always said this, and uh, I think we're, everything is accelerating right now, you see. So let's take an example. There are now so many programs on television that deal with UFOs that deal with aliens and that deal with the paranormal and uh, you name it uh, so many uh, related subjects subjects are being discussed on uh, television programs you know plus Hollywood is producing more and more films that deal with the so-called alien presence uh, so this is an indication that we are slowly being conditioned. This document came from Government Technology Magazine in 1993. Now this guy is no flake. The Government Technology Magazine is something you probably haven't heard about. It's an insider monthly periodical that goes out to the people who are creating the info highway. These people create uh, new government systems of computerized control in local, state, and federal government. And this is a very prestigious monthly publication that uh, is well, you know, is very well esteemed. And this guy here is the managing editor of Government Technology Monthly Magazine. And he said this, though, in an editorial in his magazine called, that he entitled, The Identity Crisis. He said this in uh, December of 1993 about the coming ID cards. Listen to what he says. The word for tomorrow is not plastic or even information. It is your identity. And government agencies from the IRS to the California Department of Motor Vehicles are making plans to identify you electronically. How? Electronically identify you, okay? He says, whatever you call it, 
a national health care card as the clintons proposed a tamper proof social security card a national or state driver's license of some kind or whatever other kind of proposed universal card what we're really looking at here is not just a card folks we're looking at a national identity card in disguise instead of officials asking you for your papers in the future as adolf hitler did during world war ii we'll have officials swiping your new fancy unalterable cards through reading devices thereafter your credit history your driving history your photo your arrest your warrants your existing bank balance your social security number your marital status your health records your home ownership your consumer profile your employment history, your religion, statements from your worst enemies, etc., 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 can be popped up instantaneously at the push of a few computer be keys. He says the technology is easy, and here your privacy is history. It's a very lengthy editorial, but that's enough, isn't it? So he says regardless of what they're calling it, they're blowing smoke in our ears. It's whatever these cards we're getting, the driver's licenses, or they're disguised national identity cards that will electronically identify us in a big, massive system of network databases. All right? We're going to scream now. Okay, now, first of all, I'm going to let you listen to David Rockefeller uh, being introduced on this audio tape. Now, I had the C-SPAN videotape from this uh, uh, banquet. It was a banquet in New York City about a year and a half ago. And uh, he was being introduced at the banquet in New York City by the mayor of the city of New York. Now, very rarely do you get this kind of self-nailing, self-incriminating information on a C-SPAN tape over cable. But I have a copy of the whole uh, VCR tape, and uh, I'm gonna let you listen to a very small portion of the audio portion of this C-SPAN broadcast about a year and a half ago, where the mayor of the city of New York introduces David Rockefeller as a Bilderberger, as a trilateral commission founder and as a council on foreign relations uh, manager for 15 years. And also, uh, he says, David, thank you for bringing us the United Nations of World Communism. Well, he doesn't say World Communism, does he? And then Rockefeller says very eloquently, very soft-spokenly, he says, uh, this present window of opportunity during which a truly peaceful interdependent order. Now, we all know that Whenever they use that terminology, it means what? New world order. So interdependent world order means the same thing as new world order. So Rockefeller says the present window of opportunity during which a new world order can be, abroad, uh, be brought about will not be open for very much longer. And then he identifies the enemies of the new world order, nationalists or patriots and fundamentalists. Okay, so I'm going to let you listen to this, and then we're going to get into more ID card and how we're going to, uh, material on how we're going to be controlled in Rockefeller's and Satan's New World Order. See? Let's go. Well, it'll list just a uh, very, very few of uh, David's uh, contributions. He was the founder of the America Society, an organization that promotes inter-American cooperation. He helped found the Trilateral Commission, designed to promote understanding and cooperation among the nations of North America, Western Europe, and Japan. He was instrumental in creating the International Executive Service Corps, a group of volunteers from the private sector who provide technical and managerial assistance to private enterprise and developing nations. For 15 years, he served as the chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations. Among other international achievements, David Rockefeller is the honorary chairman of the Japan Society, an honorary trustee of the International House, and a member of the Advisory Council of the Bilderberg uh, Conference. Uh, David, as the mayor of New York City, I want to thank you very, very much for bringing the United Nations to New York City. As a citizen of the United States, I want to thank you very much for all that you have done for America, you and your family, and as a citizen of the world, thank you for everything you've done for world peace. And this present window of opportunity during which a truly peaceful and interdependent world order might be built will not be here for open for too long. Already there are powerful forces at work that threaten to destroy all of our hopes and efforts to erect an enduring structure of global cooperation. 
I refer here to those ruthless advocates of ethnic nationalism who seek to break apart existing nations as well as to militant fundamentalists. You militant fundamentalist patriot wackos. You extremist constitutionalist dirtbags. You're the powerful force that's rising up to destroy all of our hard-earned work for a communist new world order under the devil. Shame on you, and we will get you. I think he's going to find himself between a Rockefeller and a hard place pretty soon. How about you? Okay, let's get into ID cards and how we're all going to be enslaved in Rocky's new world order. All right. The other establishment was written by Thomas Smith a number of years ago after he retired from the CIA. He was a specialist in how citizens are controlled in totalitarian society. So uh, you notice the logo on the front of his book is the communist logo for communist Russia. And it's interesting that it almost exactly parallels the logo for the United Nations, which is communist, which you heard Rocky gave to us. You know Rocky Rockefeller? donated the land on which the United Nations building sits. He also, his banks financed the construction of the building. And the mayor said, thank you for giving us a United Nations of global communism. Dear Rocky, my love. Uh, in the final analysis in this book, he says, the difference between living in a democracy or a totalitarian state really comes down to the control of the individual. This book is about what life is really like in Soviet controlled world in the Soviet-controlled world and how total dominance is achieved over people there. The communists have for a long time known that maintaining power relies on the complete control of the masses and they accomplish this through an extensive system of mandatory identity documents and work verification documents. Now in the book it says, and I'll just, you know, it's a very extensive book and I just want to say this that uh, the Nazi Germany required all citizens under Hitler at age 16 or over to have a national ID card, your papers. Russians, uh, the, Russia, uh, the Russian Federation did the same thing. Communist Russia required that all citizens over the age of 16 have a national identity card and now there's a bill called H.R. Uh, 756 to require all American citizens over the age of 16 to have a national ID card by the year 2000. I'm going to show that to you. Interesting, huh? You see, this new world order here exactly parallels the old one. You know, there's nothing new under the sun except enslavementism called the new world order, okay? So essentially, that's all I want to uh, convey to you out of this, that uh, communist and other totalitarian regimes always control their people by issuing identity documents and work verification documents. And this one in particular, though, is a little more truthful than the others I'm about to show you. This one here is from the Palm Springs Desert Sun, dated September 10, 1994, and it says, Beware, Americans, here in the viewpoint section. Beware, Americans, Big Brother may snoop on you as never before. And of course, it describes a number of ways in which we'll be snooped on, including uh, forward-looking infrared devices from helicopters and so on. I mean, this is in the Palm Springs newspaper. This isn't published by some anti-government right-wing extremist group like us. Okay, but anyway, specifically regarding the national ID card, here's what it says. It says, by 2000, we'll all be required to have a national ID card. Now, this was in the Palm Springs newspaper. And it says, by the year 2000, you will not get the job you want without your national ID card, and check this, you may even be subject to arrest without it. Now remember the other guy from Government Technology Magazine, he said they're going to sneak up on us with a disguised national ID card in the form of what? A new driver's license. And that's exactly what's happening. In fact, it's called NCIC 2000, meaning the National Crime Information Center or the FBI database. Now, the FBI has been secretly funding, not really secretly, but very quietly funding uh, a national ID system through our state departments of motor vehicles. And under their policy, uh, uh, under their program, uh, uh, which this is a copy of directly from the federal government, it's called the Motor Voter Worker Database. Does that make sense? The motor is your DMV record. 
database, the motor, and your voter is the card you haven't yet got, but you're going to get it by 2000. It's your national voter ID card from the feds. Okay? Because you might defraud them out of an incorrect vote. So you're going to have to have a national voter ID card by 2000. So it's called the Motor Voter Worker Database System of Network Databases, you see? And the feds are quietly funding this first through the DMVs, and then they're going to come up with a voter ID card, and then your immigration work card, and we'll all have to call 1-800-BIG-BROTHER to get permission to get a job. And so now, uh, if that doesn't do it, listen, there are 38 pending bills that somehow incorporate a national ID card for terrorism control or whatever or immigration, and the immigration bill just passed, but there were a whole bunch of immigration bills in both the House and the Senate, just in case that one didn't go through. But that one went through as 2202, and one of your old songwriters, you know, Mr. Sonny Bono, you know? I know you don't share about him anymore, but uh, Mr. Sonny Bono from Palm Springs sponsored that bill to give us a national ID card, right? Okay, so now Al Gore has proposed this card. Now, this is an actual photograph of Al Gore's proposed health care card, I mean his, uh, his electronic benefits transfer card that would have been a health care card, but that didn't go through, so they got another plan, see? Now you're going to get a government benefit security card, and uh, it's going to be required by 1999, front page Los Angeles Times said, electronic transfer benefit plan for benefits unveiled. You'll get a new debit card through which all government benefits, local, state, and federal, must be issued in just three years, electronically. You see, you won't get them in paper checks anymore. They'll have to be electronically credited to your account via cards. Electronic funds transfer, you see. Now, that we can go into that cashless society whereby there'll be no cash, no coins, it'll all be illegal. And then you'll have to go through a computer for everything and think how easily Big Brother can terminate you on the computers, and you'll have no buying and selling without the mark. That's what Scripture says. That's what's coming. Okay, now this is just one of those 38 bills I told you about, okay? H.R. 756 was proposed January 1995, and they got so many of them that if one doesn't fly, they're going to get us some other way. 38 of them. Senate Bill 269, Senate Bill 580 by Feinstein, H.R. 1915, H.R. 756, and on and on and on. So many of them that if one or two fail, we're going to get a national ID card regardless. You see, what going, you see what they're doing up there? So H.R. 756 under Title III, Employment, okay, subsection C says this. By January 1 of the year 2000, hello, three years from now, all individuals over the age of 16 must have the card. You see, it's identical to Soviet Russia and Nazi Germany. The New World Order is going to be a rerun in a very sophisticated, repackaged form called global democracy. does not strike at the fundamental principles of the republic.